Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and this is Your Strata Property. Michael Ferrier is the founder and MD of Ion Property Inspections, home of the open access inspections model. Michael has over 30 years of experience across government policy, financial services, banking, franchising, building small businesses, and of course, property. A keen golfer and rugby nut, Michael says that he likes problems because it's fun to find solutions. The challenge is to find solutions that also provide good business opportunities. Today, I am delighted to welcome Michael Ferrier of Ion Property Inspections. Welcome, Michael. Morning, Amanda. How are you? I am doing very well. It is a pleasure to have you with me today on the show. And I'm pretty sure that you are our first uh, Strata Records inspector or uh, property inspector on the show, but it's something we talk about so much, inspecting books and records and the importance of those documents. So I'm really excited to have you here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's, uh, it's a very interesting area. And even though I don't personally inspect records much because I've got some good people that do that most of the time, it's been a very topical area lately. And um, there's a lot of areas we could talk about. <laughs> Definitely, yes. We have in New South Wales just had our new building commissioner, David Chandler, come out and say that it is buyer beware when it comes to purchasing apartments. And we've had a fair bit of media about that. So it's definitely a good time to be talking about this. The angle we're going to take today in particular relates to inspection of books and records, which yep. from my point of view as a, a lawyer, as someone working with new purchasers, new owners, the importance of that exercise cannot be overstated. But I'm going to ask you, Michael, to kick off and share with us exactly what it is that Strata Records inspectors do. What is it that your company does? What would a records inspector working for you be doing day to day? So it's pretty simple, really. We, um, we make appointments for them to attend strata managers mostly. Uh, they still mostly go to the strata manager's office. In a, in a few cases, we can get remote access to their portal to access their record system. But, but normally, no, we have to go to the strata manager's office. We need to make an appointment with them, and then our inspector will turn up at their office and be allocated uh, some time, usually it's an hour, sometimes it goes longer than that, but um, usually about an hour to get access to their system. And that can be uh, in front of a terminal sometimes. It can also be still physical paper records to go through and look at all the documents relating to a strata plan, an apartment building usually. And then they collect the information from those records and then turn that into a report which covers a whole lot of different categories about strata buildings. And then the source documents are also attached to the report. So the report itself runs to about 16 or 18 pages of information. And then depending on the building, there could be about 50 to 500 pages of attachments. It just depends what's going on in that particular strata plan. And who is your client in this exercise? Who are you doing this for? Our ultimate client in all cases will be people looking to buy property. But a lot more commonly, you mentioned in the intro about our open access service. That service is specifically designed to get the vendors involved in the process. The reason we started that service was that it continues to be expensive for buyers and often they're up against time pressure. And so scheduling is a big problem. By getting the vendor involved, it means you can have a report available for buyers immediately. And also you can reduce their financial risk a little bit by making the report available to those buyers more cheaply. So probably these days, almost in the majority would be the work that, that is initiated 
through the selling agent or the vendor directly. We obviously also do work directly for buyers, buyers agents, law firms, you know, all of those people who are directly representing buyers where we don't already have a report available on the building. Mm. That is certainly something I have seen change over recent years, that we are seeing more strata inspection reports being commissioned, if you like, by vendors who are selling and want to be able to provide a report quickly and easily to purchasers. I'm not sure that we were seeing that maybe five, 10 years ago. Uh, From my perspective, that's becoming more popular. And what I am interested to hear from you, Michael, do you receive instructions from vendors to produce a particular type of report to maybe take things out of a report that might not be so flattering about the building? How do you deal with that if you get those requests from your clients? Look, it's very straightforward. We won't do it. And, you know, we have to remain independent. We have to be able to provide professional and timely advice to people who are looking to buy property. And, look, it would be unethical, of course, for us to do that. Our inspectors don't know who they're doing the report for or who commissioned the report. Uh So to them, every job is the same. So they get paid a fee to do the work for us, but they don't know. Then that's one of the things that I think where we're a little bit different is we, we control all of the customer relationships. We make all the bookings at the strata managers' offices, et cetera. They attend, prepare the report. They don't really know who the original client is. And when buyers download the report from our website, then they follow up with our team in the first instance in our office. And so they get direct advice from our customer service team. All of the reports that we do are audited, if you like, before they go on our website. So there's a quality control process they go through. And that means that our customer service team are well and truly on top of, you know, what's happening in strata reports and can give good advice to buyers straight away. So we we think that's a very, very important part of the process. And when we developed the product, and, and I'm pretty sure we were the first people to do it, we were very, very concerned about this perception that those reports may not be independent. And so we, we spent a lot of time on our system and a lot of time on our processes to make sure that, you know, we'd be happy that uh, they were getting exactly the same service and report quality that they would if they commissioned the report directly. That's the buyers we're talking about. Mm, good to hear. You mentioned there, Michael, the access sometimes is to hard copy books and records. Sometimes it's via a portal. No doubt you're seeing more and more of these portals. What's your view on the portal? Does that work well? Is that uh, more difficult? Is it harder to get good information? Do you prefer that? I think the, to step back just a little bit, the, the first comment to make is that the quality and access of records at strata managers is very varied. And there's a lot of poor record keeping and it doesn't matter whether their system is a remote portal or whether it's all electronic or whether it's all paper. Sometimes it's difficult to find records. Sometimes the quality of the record keeping is poor and the level of information is low. And that, that's an ongoing issue. Um, it's an issue that I've written a little bit about in the past because, you know, there's been a lot of media coverage about the quality of the buildings themselves in terms of construction defects. But I think that the issues with strata record keeping are just as bad. And, you know, they're not as high profile, but uh, there's big issues there. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an issue we face every day. And you can you can log into a portal and get, very good information and find the information easy to find. You can attend an office and find the information isn't hard to find. And the level of support that you get from strata managers is also sometimes an issue. Some of them don't want to answer questions. They get very concerned about having an impact on the sale of a property. Others are are quite helpful. So again, that's a mixed bag. 
Mm. I imagine uh, the reception that you get when you sit down to do a records inspection might be a little bit different to the one that I get when I sit down to do a records inspection. Often I know the strata managers in the company that I'm attending and the word gets around the office pretty quickly that Amanda is here doing an inspection. I wonder who she's suing. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I know that feeling of asking questions and not being able to get answers, but I suppose fair enough when it's a lawyer asking them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it shouldn't make any difference, of course, you know, who's looking at the records. You're there because you've been given authority to search the records by an owner. Mm-hmm. So are we. Mm. You know, ultimately, that's, that's an important point with strata inspections is that you can only get access to the records with an authority from the owner or the owner's agent. In our case, mostly comes from the selling agent. But you need that. So you really have to get in there on the owner's permission anyway, whether or not you're directly doing the report for a buyer or it's a seller who's, uh, who's initiated the process. And we are going to get stuck into perhaps some difficulties that purchasers can face if they don't search the records or perhaps the records are not accurate at the time that they had a look at them and they've gone ahead with a purchase and there are some surprises. But first of all, uh, just in case anyone listening is not sure about this, I know your view, Michael, is that it is just critical for people to be doing these inspections. Why do you say that? Why do we all recommend, those of us who are experienced in this industry, recommend that purchasers looking at buying strata properties should be doing these professional inspections? Well, I think the most important way to look at it is that when you're buying into a strata plan, you're buying into a community. Now, it could be a small community of a few apartments or it could be a much larger community. And if you're buying into a community, I think it's really important to know what that community is like, whether it's financial, whether there are issues, whether there are issues with the building itself or whether there's issues with the community in terms of problems in the building, whether there's harmony or whether there's disputes going on between owners in the building, that type of thing. I just think it's essential that whether you're an investor or whether you're an owner-occupier, that the quality of that community and it covers a whole lot of facets, is going to be an important aspect of your purchase and your investment. So I just think that why would you make such a big investment without understanding what it is you're buying into? A lot of people don't understand strata very well either, so they're not really clear on what it is they're buying into. In fact, what they are buying. You know, They think they're buying part of the building. Well, they're not really, are they? They're buying that's sort of that airspace between the walls in in many ways. But while they're only buying that, they also had buying into their share of the obligations of running and maintaining that building. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's always struck me as slightly odd that people will spend many hundreds of thousands of, of dollars or more on a property, but they don't want to spend, you know, a few hundred dollars in the worst case to find out what's happening in that building. And I think in many cases, people are really surprised what they can find out from Strata Report as well. Yeah, and I think there's a a lot to be gained by going and having a look yourself if you are the person purchasing and you might not know anything about Strata or Strata Law, but having a look yourself assuming that the records are there and there's enough records there for you to get a picture, you're going to get some benefit from that. But I do often say um, you may not know what you're looking for or what to look for or perhaps more importantly what's missing unless you have someone who's experienced at doing this job go and do it. We know what it is that the legislation requires to be kept by the Owners Corporation And if, for example, we have two years' worth of email correspondence that just doesn't exist, there's nothing from 2018, nothing from 2019, then we're going to be asking that question, whereas somebody who was not across the requirements of what should be on the records may not even notice that. And I find that what's set out in emails to and from the strata manager is often the most enlightening correspondence. No, look, you're absolutely right. And, um, you you know, you're talking about email correspondence missing one of the issues that comes up very commonly, and I hope I'm not jumping ahead here, is in a situation where the strata plan have changed strata managers. And so the new strata manager takes over, but the records from the old strata manager sometimes almost disappear into the ether, or there's only very limited records. You know, And that can mean that there's limited records from six months ago, which is a real problem. And that 
there doesn't seem to be enough care taken through this change of strata manager to make sure that the integrity of the records is maintained. And that is a big problem because they've all got their own systems, they don't match up, and so when you change strata manager, they often finish up with a, a disk or a stick that's got thousands of files on it and it sort of just gets put in a drawer and that they don't really try to integrate it into their own system very well. I'm sure that, um, that's not always the case, but very often it is. And uh, it's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah. It is. I've definitely experienced that where the strata manager will say, here's the USB that I got from the former strata manager. You'll open it up and it'll be a, a schmozzle of files with odd file names and a software program that just cannot open those files. And often there's no real response to that or concern about that or understanding that this is not a legal way to keep the owners' corporations' books and records. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think the owners' corporations don't think enough about this either. Mm. So essentially they're outsourcing their record keeping to the strata manager. But at the end of the day, it's their records. They're not the strata manager's records. They're the building's records. And the owners should be taking more care and be more insistent that those records are kept and that indeed they have their own copy of those records. So you'd think technology would be assisting here. But so far, I'm not seeing a huge amount of evidence that it is. So. Mm, interesting from your perspective. Mm. Can you share a story or two, Michael, uh, perhaps a client that you've worked with, whether it be a good or a bad, maybe one of each, where a records inspection has had a role to play uh, in an outcome? Well, there's many. <laughs> What's been interesting recently since the Opal Towers and Mascot Towers uh, buildings have come into focus is that a lot of people are a lot more aware. And so what I find interesting is that we can do a report on a building that clearly has issues and many newer buildings, you know, we could talk for hours about the types of issues we see in newer buildings and mostly they revolve around defects and so on. What I find really interesting is that people look at the building, they obviously like the apartment, they'll then look at the strata records report and they'll contact us because they're concerned about what's in it and we spend a fair bit of time explaining to them the issues that are there. Many people are still looking to say, okay, but I still like the place, I'd still like to buy it. And they'll get focused perhaps on the financial issues. So there could be potentially millions of dollars in unfunded rectification works that ultimately the owners will have to pay for through special levies. But they don't think about the disruption and the impact, whether they're living there or investing on their quality of life during what could be years to have these, this work done. And they, I still feel that people get a bit emotional about, oh, I like this building. And sometimes you think they're looking, well, maybe I'll get this at a bit of a bargain because there's some issues in here. And I don't think, that, I still don't think they're thinking through the issues completely. And so I think that's a common thing where we spend time with people just explaining to them not just the current situation, whether that be a financial situation or whether it be the type of defects that are in the building, but I think we can assist them by explaining to them, just giving them a heads up a little bit, that don't forget there are other issues here that you need to think about. So we see that quite a bit. At the other end of that, sometimes you'll see a building that's had a lot of issues, but now those issues are largely behind the building. And so people can feel a little bit more confident and perhaps feel that the risk is lower coming into this building because, you know, it looks as if most of those issues are resolved. I can think of one building that had massive issues and, you know, it was probably, you know, a no-go zone for buyers. But the owners' corporation got hold of those issues they worked very hard to get them resolved. And now, three or four years on, when you see the records for that building, it actually looks a really good and well-run, well-managed building. So buildings can turn around, so they can change over time. But, uh, yes. yeah, I mean, I hope that gives you a little bit of flavour for a couple of areas at least, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And such an important point that I'm sure is overlooked by so many 
the value that your records hold and how you can improve or increase the value of your investment simply by tidying up your records. And it might be, yes, as you say, Michael, there are things to do around the building. I've certainly been involved with buildings like that before where there's a number of projects on, there's some litigation, that needs to be resolved, this rectification work needs to be done, we need to get the bylaws in order, we need a new strata manager, whatever it is, tick those things off. But a building could be operating wonderfully, but if your records are not up to date or don't exist, then your potential purchasers are not even going to see that and you're not going to have, you know, that best building in the street uh, mentality, if you like, when people are, are coming to have a look. So, yeah, I really love that point about the, the value that's in your records. Yeah, and so I think the other thing about records to say, this is, again, from the owner's perspective, is I think that there's a real shortage in detail often. You'll have seen this yourself many times. You look at the minutes for meetings and they're, you know, one-line resolutions with no real information, and they're quite important resolutions. We're raising a special levy for a million dollars, but they don't even really tell you much about why. What's the rationale? You know, what's the longer-term plan? In other buildings, you'll get really quite detailed reports from a building manager or a treasurer or something like that will explain, look, we're in this situation. This is how we're going to manage it going forward. And as a reader, or and potentially as a buyer, that makes it's much easier to get your head around. So you can understand the issues and you can see they have a plan to resolve it and they're being open with the other owners about it. And I think that that actually creates more confidence, even if there are issues in the building, that they actually working together to, to solve these things. In other cases, there are issues going on and you can't really see what their plan is. And in some ways, you almost get the impression they don't want to say very much because Saying more might impact the value of the, of the properties, you know, in the short term. Yeah. And I don't see – there might be a perceived short-term benefit, but in the longer term, I just don't think that's a good way to manage the building. Mm, I agree. There is a lot to be said for the regular newsletter or chairperson's report that happens before each – annual general meeting that goes out with the agenda, regular committee meetings. Because I agree, minutes of meetings, agendas for meetings often don't reveal too much. It's the once a month update that's going out to all residents that's really going to fill in those gaps and make that purchaser comfortable and confident that nothing is being hidden, which is important. Also, that is why I always go first to the correspondence file and look for the emails because nine times out of ten we're communicating by email now and it never ceases to amaze me how much people will put in an email, what they will say about others in the building, about the strata manager or about uh, their fellow committee members and thinking that it's not going to form part of the records. It absolutely does. Yeah, no, that's right, yeah. And you can gain great insight from that everyday correspondence. So that's always an important uh, folder, I think, to find if you can find it. If you can find it. I was just about to make that, that point absolutely that sometimes it's quite hard to find those emails. And the other thing that you often don't know when somebody turns up to the strata manager's office is whether there are files sitting on the strata manager's desk yes. that aren't, aren't ever even offered for inspection. And there could be an issue, it could be a legal issue that's, or there's a current issue that they're dealing with at the time you go to the office and you may never even see those files. And that's a problem too because, you know, then the files aren't all in one place. You know, if, here's a box with all our files, but uh, except for the three files that are sitting on the strata manager's desk. And they're, they're probably the most important current issues. Yes. For sure. Have you ever had the experience, Michael, of a, a client who has overlooked the existence or the operation or the effect of a bylaw? And perhaps the agent might have said to them, you have the use of this part of the property, this is your courtyard or this is your terrace. And of course, not being educated in strata matters, the purchaser has not realise that A, it's not marked on the plan and B, there's no bylaw or the bylaw doesn't actually say that I have the exclusive use of that area or it's a different area. I find those kind of revelations that can occur only by looking at the books and records are some of the most valuable, if you like, when it comes to purchasers understanding what it is they're buying. And if they don't 
look properly at the contract and certainly properly at the records, not understanding what's going on in the building at the time that they're purchasing, those kind of rights can be lost or misunderstood or overpaid for? Yes, that's true. And look, sometimes we, we're a bit blind to those things because we'll get a request to search lot four of Strata Plan 1234, for example, which will be the apartment they're buying. They think they're buying that apartment and perhaps uh, you know, part of a rooftop terrace or something like that. We've got no knowledge of that and we don't see the contract. So we'll go and do a search based on the information we're given. And so we're not aware that the agent is saying to them, you've got exclusive use of this area. So unless the buyer comes to us and says, look, I'm, I can't see this, you know, wh why aren't I paying levies for this as well or whatever it is, or I, I can't see a bylaw for this, then I think that that's an area where um, we don't necessarily know what's happening on the other side. Yeah. And there's a big role there for conveyances and lawyers who are acting for purchasers on these contracts to, I believe, sit with the purchaser, look at the strata plan, say, this is the area that you're buying. Does that look like what you inspected? And I believe to have a look at the marketing that's being issued by the agent and that your client has been relying on and to make sure that that too matches what's shown in the strata plan and in the bylaws. I don't do any convincing anymore. I did back when I was a, a baby lawyer, but I know that that process is becoming cheaper and cheaper and more competitive. And I think that's pretty scary, especially when it comes to buying strata properties. We had an example just a couple of weeks ago where there had been some new bylaws passed about the exclusive use of a couple, for a couple of units in a strata plan and one of those units was being sold 12 months afterwards and the strata plan had not been updated. 12 months after they'd passed the resolutions to change the unit entitlement and, oh, and so on. Dear. And so it caused an issue for the vendor because the vendor knew that what they were selling included this but when we came to search the records, the unit entitlement hadn't been updated and so the information in the records didn't reflect. Other, I mean, obviously, we saw the resolution in the meeting, but, yeah, the other documents didn't match up. And um, they just hadn't got around to it. So, you know, that, that caused – it got resolved, but it, it's a similar issue that you're talking about. And it's just – again, it's just a, another example of poor record keeping. Yeah, and you can see how this process of buyer beware and the education that these purchasers have to undergo is coming from various different angles. It's coming from their uh, lawyer or their conveyance that they've engaged. It's coming from the person who's preparing the strata records uh, inspection. It's coming from the agent. It's coming perhaps from the uh, strata manager gathering as much information as you can so that you're then attuned to the issue when the information doesn't match. Is going to be really important. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Michael, have you noticed some uh, common or recurring problems that strata buildings face when it comes to keeping and maintaining accurate records? And have you got any recommendations for how they might overcome those problems? One of the important things that we're always looking at are financials and associated with that, we're always looking for any large items of expenditure um, that may indicate potential issues in the building. Often the description of expenditure items is vague at best. And this is an area where I think records could be improved dramatically if they just took a little bit more time to put a bit more detail into the information that's in the financials. Because often if you see a expenditure for $20,000 for consultants or you see $20,000 for legal fees, then it's a red flag because why are they in? Because the consultants is often a code for structural engineers and the legal expenses being, well, you know, who are we taking legal action against or who's taking legal action against us? But it's hard to find the information sometimes. So it highlights an information gap, both in terms of the physical records, but there's a big information gap there in the financial records in terms of the way they describe things. So I think that's an area that many strata managers and strata owners corporations could improve the records just by better description. This is a little bit like what we talked about earlier with, with minutes as well, is putting a little bit more information into the minutes makes a massive difference to the understanding of what's going on. 
And I think creates better transparency. And I think better transparency can lead to better confidence for both uh, for people buying into the building, but also I think better outcomes for people selling. I think there's a pervasive view that sometimes less information is better, but yeah, that's not my view. So certainly that's one area. And as I mentioned before, if the owners corporation decide they want to change strata managers, then they should be on the front foot about managing that process and the impact it has on their records. They should be aware up front that that could mean an issue and they should be making an allowance to insist. So what I mean by an allowance is that to make sure that the new strata manager does spend the time to integrate the old records into their system. Now, that may cost the owners corporation some money, but I think it's money well spent so that the information becomes complete. As I said before, it's the owners corporation records, not the strata, strata manager's records. So, and I think that that's an issue. But so why do people change strata managers? Well, it could be that the individual manager just hasn't done a good job for them. But it also could be that they're looking to save a bit of money on strata management fees. And again, that could be a, a short-term saving, but ultimately you could finish up with worse records and perhaps a worse strata plan. Yeah, a really good tip and I agree and all of our uh, owners listening should bear that one in mind that you are in control and you you are in control of giving that instruction to your new strata manager to make sure that the records are in order and yes, if it means paying a bit extra for a, an assistant to go through all of the unnamed electronic files and sort those out, it's going to certainly save time and money down the track, I believe. Just on the technical side, do the various companies who produce software for the strata sector, do they ever consult with you or with people like you about what you're seeing in these records? What is it that is hard for you to read, to understand? Because I know when I raise these issues, when I look at financials and say, okay, why do we have a, a lump sum, 250000 here that just says special levy? It doesn't actually say what it's for. And often the answer I get is, oh, the system doesn't allow us, or that's what the system provides for. Whether you accept that or not is one thing, but I could see great benefit in people who are producing this technology in these uh, systems, and I know there are various options out there and, and new things happening all the time, to be talking to people like you and understanding what the problems are so that they can build a system that solves these problems. Yeah, I've had a few conversations with businesses that have created these strata portals, and on paper they look very interesting, you know, where the opportunities are, and it's exactly in the areas you're talking about, about better detail, but also helping to manage the change. So. I think with some of them, in theory, you could change strata manager, but the records, there should be nothing happens with the records. The, the records stay with the same portal, but a different manager looks after them. So you get that continuity. I can hear all the strata managers going, no, can you imagine no, what yeah, they would exactly. do to us? <laughs> but yes, I understand the logic. Another area that came up was to do with buildings insurance. And so there'll be documents in the records that could actually help owners' corporations get better insurance rates. So I've been a big believer for a long time that if you look after your building, then why can't you negotiate a, a better insurance rate? And insurance, as you all know, is usually the biggest expense that a strata plan has. You know, if you can demonstrate that you're actively looking after your, the, the building and that, you know, there aren't any issues there, why aren't you a lower risk? So I, I hear that these portals are talking with the insurance companies about some of this stuff as well. I mean, of course, that can work the other way, that if there's issues in the building, then the insurance companies may look at them and say, well, you know, there's a bit more risk here. It's a much broader topic. But, yeah, look, I definitely think there's areas there that where technology can, can help you. Yes. Um, but it just seems to me an industry that moves incredibly slow. And many of the big strata managers have legacy systems and more than one in many cases, and those systems don't communicate very well. But on the other hand, so we had a, an example just on Friday where we were trying to assist somebody overseas to bid at an auction on Saturday, and the only way that we could get somebody to inspect those records was for them to be able to access them at a remote location from where the physical strata manager was. So. In the same group, but at a different office. 
and their technology enabled us to do that. So we were able to get in, do the inspection, get this report out on Saturday morning, as it turned out, so that they could bid at auction at 11.30. So that there, the technology helped us. But uh, in other cases, you know, it just makes it harder. Yeah, and I know that we have a lot of uh, innovative people who listen to this podcast and a number who are building software to assist strata schemes in all different respects. So when I ask for you to uh, give your details at the end of this discussion, Michael, my suggestion may be taken up and you'll be flooded with some uh, requests for coffees. (laughs) Sorry about that. No, that's fine. I I don't mind that actually because I actually find that it's good for us to understand what's happening in the industry. Mm-hmm. And I'm quite interested to throw my 20 cents into the into the conversation because I think ultimately it can only improve what I think. And what I've already said, I think is a pretty poor system at the moment overall. Mm. And thank you. We are, we are lucky to have your two cents. I'm going to shift gears now, Michael, and ask you about books. Every guest on the podcast gets this question. What books have had the greatest impact on you and why? I recently read a book by this guy, Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater Associates. It's the biggest hedge fund in the world. Yes. And you have to be careful about these books because they're written by people who've had fantastic success and so you don't hear too many of the stories. But I think that the reason I found that book very interesting was that success, you know, you can say, you know, I got overnight success after 20 years or something like exactly. that. I think, you, you know, I think what it highlights is that you do need to just keep doing the small things well and ultimately, you know, they can turn into bigger successes. So so I found that book quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's Principles, Ray Dalio's Principles, is it? Yes, Principles. Sorry, I was struggling to remember the name. No, that's okay. I had it on audiobook. It was very good for um, getting me to sleep at night. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> Lots of detail in there and you can understand why the, how this guy became as successful as he is. But yeah. if you're exactly right. It's all about the small things and the, each step at a time and the principles. Yes, yes, precisely. Thank you for sharing. I am going to ask you how listeners find out more about you, Michael, and uh, anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Well, they can obviously just come to ion.com.au. And I'll just spell that. It's E Y E. O N. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Ion.com.au. Yeah, and so there's there's information about all our services there for vendors and for buyers about how they work. Any reports that we've done are accessible directly through our website. We encourage people to call us if they've got any questions, if you if they're thinking of buying or thinking of selling. We're more than happy to provide support to people on the phone, whether or not they're using our service. We think ultimately that works for us in the long term. So if people out there, owners who are thinking about selling or people who are thinking to buying into an apartment for the first time, please call us. So we've also got quite a lot of articles and blog posts on our website as well that talk about some of these issues, including the issues around buying and selling apartments. I've written some articles about record keeping, which we've been talking about today, which are there as well. And so, yeah, so there's a fair bit of information there and the phone is also there for people as well. Excellent. It is such an important topic and we have talked around it, alluded to it, mentioned it on the podcast so many times. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to have this in-depth discussion with you, Michael. And uh, there's a lot more in my notes here, but we are running out of time. So it may be a, uh, a part two down the track for us if you've got time. Yeah, lovely. Enjoyed it, Amanda, and love to do it again. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today? today?